chance to to talk with you today. Um, it's sort of fun that I can sit here in my office and hopefully get to speak with you guys a little bit during this talk um, uh, on hypospadias. Um, you know, I have a set number of slides. We do not have to get through all of them. Please um, chime in. I will try to monitor the chat box um, ahead of uh, ahead of time. Um, so if I see a chat come in, I'll try to stop to uh, to answer it. If I miss it, then at the end we can go over everything. But I just want um, this to be as as useful to you guys as possible. Um, I'm going to start sharing my my screen now. Uh, and we'll we'll get started. So the theme for today, um, you know, there's, there's so many different things you can talk about hypospadias, but I think the thing that I'm going to harp on a little bit is the more than meets the eye part of hypospadias. Um, this is not even a real history to offer you, but this is a the sort of the spectrum of the time map of of when hypospadias was first described back in uh, by Heliodorus, and then. The generations that have spent their time and efforts working on studying uh, and developing ways to fix hypospadia, starting you know in the mid 1800s, mid to late 1800s, with names that you start to recognize like Tiersen du Clay, and onwards to you know, Cecil and Byers in the, in the mid 1900s, and then all the developments that have gone on, all the publications that have have uh, been written on hypospadia, so over 6,000 publications since 1945 the various different uh, procedures and variations of procedures, all that goes to show that there's one, this is a, a complex problem, and two, there's probably not one way to manage it because if there was one best way to manage it, we would have that one way and we would all do the same thing. So that's just sort of a background perspective. Um, a lot of this is just gonna be very introductory hypospadias. I think that there might be some junior residents on the talk, um, so uh, starting from the basics of what is hypospadias, it really combines a, a triad. Um, and whenever I meet uh, families in clinic, I go over sort of this triad of what's included in a hypospadias, of uh, the ectopic uh, urethral location on the ventral surface. Um, if it goes on the dorsal surface, that's epispadias, and that's a whole other uh, uh, talk that we can we can go for, go on um, a different detour one day. Uh, penile curvature um, with ventral curvature and incomplete foreskin that's also often dorsally hooded. We'll see that a little bit more. So uh, as far as the curvature, it can be uh, you know totally straight penis. It can be mild uh, curvature that's sometimes considered almost just a glance tilt, moderate uh, corporal curvature, or really severe curvature. These are just two examples of when you're looking at uh, a child either in the clinic or in the beginning of the OR, sort of very mild glance tilt likely due to skin. Here, um, more significant curvature, you can't really tell um, how much curvature is actually going to be truly there or not. The uh, other part of the, the triad is the foreskin, as I mentioned, sort of incomplete dorsally hooded foreskin. Um, with goes along with that is ventral skin deficiency. So the foreskin didn't uh, develop circumferentially, so you have this hood here. Um, there's no interpropecial skin on the ventral side, as you can see here. And most of the time, this skin, if you really see the demarcation of normal shaft skin versus under the urethra, is going to be markedly shortened. However, there is always that small 5% subset of boys with the distal hypospadias who will have intact foreskin. And that can be quite a surprise if you go to circumcise uh, a child and open up the, the physiologic phimosis and find a uh, megameatus or even a, a distal hypospadias. So uh, hypospadias occurs in about 0.3% uh, of the popu uh, population of males, about 1 in 300. Um, it does occur greater um, in families, about 13 times greater in first degree relatives. Um, twins, same sex twins are about a 50% risk. Siblings are between 9 to 17% and um, an offspring around one to three percent increased risk, and these are all numbers based on case control studies in, um, in Europe. Um, Hypospadias can be just totally isolated penile defect, and and the majority of ninety percent of cases are just isolated defects. However, um, they can have uh, associated anomalies, both genetic anomalies and other uh, syndromic uh, anomalies associated. Just very recently, Emily Johnson from um, 
in Chicago came out with uh, a publication on the associated anomalies in pro proximal hypospadias, and they reported that 53% of proximal hypospadias had associated no anomalies. You could see cryptorchidism uh, more commonly in proximal hypospadias, but also in distal hypospadias. Prostatic utricle, I almost removed from here, but um, you, a prosthetic utricle is sort of an enlarged um, remnant of the malarian system that you see a lot more in proximal hypospadias, and it's something to always be aware of as when you're putting your catheter in, um, it may be challenging to actually uh, uh, get your catheter in because the catheter will go into the, the utricle, and you might need to use a scope or a curved wire to get into the bladder. Um, and then any uh, differences of sexual differentiation, especially in um, if you have non-palpable testes and proximal hypospadias, that really has to be addressed. Um, there is a, a genetic association um, found in about 28% of those proximal hypospadias. 17% of those had actually normal testes, no undescended testes, and 53% in those with one or more undescended testes. The other syndromes that um, hypospadias can be associated with include uh, a list here. Um, so it's just something that you will find. The good thing is other than, um, you know, abnormalities like renal abnormalities that you have to really search for um, with an ultrasound, you will identify hypospadias quite easily. So what is the severity of, of hypospadias? You know, people talk about, oh, distal hypospadias is not so bad. What, what is distal? What is mid? What is proximal? What's really, really bad? Traditionally, uh, the severity was defined uh, sort of first foremost and maybe always based on the meatus location, whether it was glandular, coronal, mid-shaft, proximal. But really, I think that... Uh, and I think more and more people realize it's a combination of several factors. First of them is definitely the medial location. Obviously, a meatus that is up on the glands is going to be much better than ones on the scrotum. So the more severe um, uh, hypospadias uh, would be the, those proximal hypospadias. The other part that plays in, especially in some distal cases, but even um, more proximal, but you, I think, worry about it even more in distal cases, which are you think, all right, it's going to be a distal hypo uh, more straightforward, is the glands configuration. Now, um, is the glands intact and it's just a little distal pit? It, do you have a deeply grooved glands? So the way I, talk, again, talk to families is sometimes that urethra really want it to be there, uh, but it isn't, and, but you have a deeply grooved glands, so you know that this is going to close well. Uh, or do you have a um, only a moderate groove or a very shallow groove? Uh, with no real urethral plate um, dependent features, which can make it quite uh, challenging to roll or to stay rolled. And the last part, or one of the last parts that weighs into it is uh, curvature. How how significant is the curvature? Here you see a case looks like coronal, maybe subcoronal hypospadias, not too stenotic, all looks good, except when he's degloved and you do a... Uh, artificial erection test, the cordy was over 65 degrees. Um, so that is one of those more than meets the eye uh, cases where you really have to be um, aware of, of the possibilities and what to do in each, in each setting. So on your initial evaluation, um, you're going to be looking at uh, the location of the erythral meatus, um, as we mentioned, the degree of penile curvature, and then the other things to really look at is the skin abnormalities. Um, if there's skin deficiency um, or the, the uh, characteristics of the skin, um, this is not my picture, but I have one that looked almost identical. It's sure, the meatus looks like it's near the glands, but there's significant curvature and there's no skin over the uh, urethra. So this is all not going to be useful um, urethra. Is there any degree of penile torsion, penoscrotal webbing, penoscrotal transposition? Uh, all things to that will weigh into your approach to uh, the repair. Um, and we mentioned uh, cryptorchidism can be a part. And we already mentioned this, but if you do identify cryptorchidism in proximal hypospadias, you have to rule out any sort of dis, uh, differences of sexual differentiation. Um, on the flip side, if you have a normal, no hypospadias and bilateral non palpable testes, you also have to worry uh, in that or ha have in the back of your mind too. So sort of going into early um, the, this early surgery and repairs, really what is your what are your goals? Um, 
of uh, in hypospadias. And a lot of the goals for hypospadias, I think first and foremost is a functional repair, but cosmesis plays in there as well. So you want long straight erection. So you want to first uh, and foremost be able to have a straight penis later on and have straightness that you do and is dur a durable straightening procedure. Um, you want to advance the urethra so that you can have a straight, um, straight uh, empty. Now, if the emptying is a little bit deflected downwards, maybe it doesn't matter, but if it's totally down, uh, then it might affect um, not just your ability to, to pee standing up, but also for um, uh, ejaculation and, and fertility reasons. Um, and the flip side, your urethra meatus might be at the coronal margin and you can pee straight and, and everything uh, is efflux straight. It might not matter. Um, and then improve cosmesis um, for patients and families. I think the, the important thing there is that not everyone needs surgery. I think traditionally everyone was, you have a hypospadias, you fix a hypospadias, but there are distal variations where the penis is entirely straight and you could have totally normal function. So it's important to acknowledge those as well. But when elective hypospadias repair does occur, it occurs usually between six and 12 months of age. Before getting into the details of what's, what are the procedures like and I have a few little videos, just other surgical considerations. Um, and there's no necessarily right answer for all of these, but just sort of bringing up the different things that people think about with respect to hypospadias is perioperative antibiotics. I think almost everyone gives antibiotics at the time of surgery, but postoperatively, do they continue? Do they not? Do you use prophylactic antibiotics while the stent is in place? Do you use just antibiotics when the stent's going to be removed? Do you use none at all? And I'll say our practice has definitely evolved within the last five years on all of that. Uh, the use of testosterone, I'll go into a little bit more, but that's always been a big um, point of uh, discussion. General anesthesia, I think most cases are done under general anesthesia, but regional anesthesia is also an area of discussion. Uh, caudal blocks, penile blocks for some distal hypospadias, or, and even uh, pudendal blocks, blocks are becoming more popular. Then as far as the actual um, surgical approach itself, uh, there's always discussions about what type of suture to use. Do you use, I think almost everyone uses absorbable sutures, monofilament are braided, um, and I've heard heated discussions on the risk of, of fistula in either one. Um, but paying attention to good surgical uh, technique with gentle tissue handling of the urethra, um, minimizing wound tension and, and skin closure tension uh, that can lead to ischemia, uh, developing multiple layers of vascularized tissue to come on top. We want either at least four or five layers on top of your repair to, to prevent fistula and ischemia. Um, how do you get your hemostasis? Do you use an, an injection of epinephrine in the glands versus a, a tourniquet? Uh, again, a lot of us have evolved here uh, of recently, and there's always discussion on that. And then, sort of the adjuncts to the surgery: um, how do you how do you visualize the the surgery? Are you using uh, loops, low power, high power loops versus a microscope? Um, and then the effects of surge and volume um, on on overall outcomes. So I mentioned um, testosterone and the use of testosterone uh, prior to the hypospadias. Um, it has been reported and documented to increase penile length, glands width or circumference, and improve vascularity. Um, although there have been also reports of uh, impairing wound healing, so that's also something that's always been considered. Um, we use it primarily with an indication of a small glands. Um, generally, we measure the glands in the clinic. If it's under 14 millimeters, then most people will give testosterone. Some people give testosterone for all comers, regardless of the size, and some people will give it to no one, regardless of the size. Um, so there's no definite there. Um, it can be given topically, although we also uh, tend to give IM injections of uh, testosterone and anthate, or you can do sipionate, um, two weeks per keg at five and five weeks before, and either two or three weeks prior. Um, sometimes I've gone to even just giving one dose prior. Uh, always families will ask about what the side effects of testosterone and something that I think we always have to think of whenever you're giving a medication um, or oh, any sort of adjunct. Um, people have reported increased aggressive behavior, even in little six-month-olds, um, temporary pubic hair growth. Um, and um, the question is, again, that has been brought up is whether or not there's compromised wound healing 
um, an effect on height or bone age. Those are not thought to be uh, present. Uh, and the other question is sometimes, uh, you know, the penis will enlarge. Is how well does it go back to its normal size? And I don't think there's any great answers to that. So starting with distal hypospadias, um, is it the, on the severity, starting with the, the um, least severe, um, there's still a wide range, uh, even among distal hypospadias. So you can have distal distal, like distal glandular uh, with a closed glands, proximal glandular, glandular megameatus, or you can go down onto the penile shaft with coronal and subcoronal. The other um, factors that might influence your repair and affect the severity are whether there is a glance tilt, uh, which might indicate some dorsal, sort of some ventral skin deficiency, or if there's no glance tilt, um, and whether or not there's even more significant cordy, as in the, the picture I showed you earlier. Um, lastly, also that dysplastic ventral skin that was in one of those other pictures, a hypospadias that looks like it's distal, it may actually be proximal. Um, so for a true distal um, hypospadias, there's many tools, um, depending on what you see and what the anatomy is from um, a urethromeataplasty, just advancing the, the uh, meatus a little bit, magpie approach, there's the, the glands uh, approximation procedure, MIV, um, tears to play, tip. Um, and then again, the, the one that I always like to just remember is no intervention at all. Um, which, it's not as popular to talk about, but I will keep on uh, mentioning it. And one just sort of aside on that is we now work with a transition urologist who's someone who's did reconstructive urology um, fellowship and now spends most of his time in the adult world, but one day a week at shop. And he advocates as much as anyone I've ever seen for not intervening on on distal um, you know, glandular or or even subcoronal or coronal hypospadias. He sees many men come in with hypospadias that's never been repaired and they've never had a problem. And so it's something I think just to be aware of, especially in this day and age. Um, but the most common approach, if you do have a uh, distal hypospadias, is the tears to play. Or I don't want to say the most common. I guess the one that we use most commonly. It's an old pr procedure tried and true, developed over 140 years ago. Um, it uh, you create a, a neo-urethra uh, over a. a appropriate size tube, usually an eight French and a little baby, um, at least one waterproofing layer, and then the glands wings come up and over it. And it said, our, that's our choice for uh, correction. And now the difference between the tears to play and the tip, which you, you see a lot about, is that there's no incision into the urethral plate. We just measure it out, um, cut the, the edges of the urethra, and tubularize that over, and then bring the glands, uh, glands around. Now, these are just some surgical vignettes that I have from one of my partners um, who makes these great videos, um, much better than I would make, um, of here's the meatus um, that he calibrates and cutting the little um, wedge that's right, um, sort of the posterior wedge, and then marking out where the uh, incisions are going to be to create the urethral meatus and the new urethra. And here is... The, um, the stent in place and what it's going to look like after those incisions were made, and then starting the tubularization. tubularization. Um, this is a 7 of um on a cutting needle. That's what it comes on. Um, and then the goal is doing a, a running, sort of waterproof type what running layer here. Again, some people use interrupteds. Um, and then it's actually a two-layer um, running closure. So running up one direction with just sort of uh, stitches parallel to the, the closure and then running back down in a Lambert fashion so you have a really watertight closure. The couple little tidbits here are making sure that you don't advance um, too far distally because one of the risks of um, that we'll mention later is uh, meatal stenosis. If you narrow this too tightly and you get developed meatal stenosis then that can compromise your repair and create a uh, fistula later on. So while the, while the penis is on tension to enable your closure, if you just take it off tension just briefly, you can sort of gauge to see how far distal you want to uh, advance. And then this is the Dartos layer. You want a nice um, vascular coverage layer to bring over the top of the, of the repair. This one is from a lateral skin. I usually still use a full dart, uh, dorsal skin flap Dartos coverage. 
and then closing the glands uh, over the top. The, the jake is used there to prevent um, snagging the dartos layer in your closure um, as you're bringing that together. And here you can see the with the initial incision, these furlet collars were prepared um, that'll create their interpropecial margin and then closing the glands uh, over the top after you've closed um, the deep glands. Um, and then the rest of the furlet collar will be closed. Um, alternatives uh, to um, your repairs, especially for distal repairs, or as I mentioned, the tubularized incised plate procedure, the tip. Um, here you're making a midline incision sort of to hinge the urethral plate, which makes the tubularization easier. The incision is supposed to be quite deep um, and going just above the corporal bodies. Um, the one concern with, with this repair is scarring uh, and contraction of that initial incision that may narrow your repair um, in the end. And we have seen some kids who come in with um, significant um, sort of distal urethral I don't know, stricture narrowing that hinders uh, urine output afterwards. Um, one alternative to this, and I do think I mention it later on, is something called the dorsal inlay graft that if you have to make, um, and I just did this a couple days ago, if you have to make a deep incision, you can always put a little graft in that may help it to heal without scarring. So we talked about uh, penile curvature as um, one of the concerns that sort of indicates severity of, of the hypospadias. Um, and the degree of, of curvature is one of the major determinants on what you're going to do. Well, if it's a minor curvature that you either do nothing or do a dorsal application versus a significant curvature that you're actually going to need a more significant approach. Um, causes of curvature, uh, shortened ventral scaf shaft skin, as I mentioned, sort of those pictures early on, that it's just really ventral skin deficiency, but once you release that and all the dysplastic bands, it's completely straight. Or can be a short and dysplastic urethra itself, or there can be intrinsic curvature of the erectile bodies. Um, so it's really important to assess this in the operating room after degloving. To you can assess the curvature before, but after degloving and after taking out all those dysplastic bands to identify what you need to do. And sometimes, you know, preparing the families ahead of time that you're going to be doing this, and it might change your approach. So these are distal cases that, you know, the ventral skin is not very good here. It's tethering um, down. I don't have an intra picture, but the, he was totally straight and didn't need anything further, and it was just the skin tethering him. Um, uh, and the same thing here. It's all just a skin tethering, and then after degloving, even though he didn't have much skin, he's totally straight, uh, unlike in the other one. So we tried to sort of put together a, a algorithm for your thought process. Now, I wanted to um, make this thought process not including specific procedures because everyone is going to have their own um, comfort level with different types of procedures, whether it's a tip or tissue to play or whatever it is. But let's say you, um, the first step of this is sort of assessing uh, curvature. Um, but if, let's say you said you have a hypospadias with any degree of penile curvature, you deglove, again, dis, uh, release those dysplastic bands, do an artificial erection test. If there's no residual curvature and it's a pretty distal. Um, you could just do a single stage repair. You're going to do urethroplasty by whatever means is your comfort zone, glansplasty, and reconstru reconstruct the penile shaft skin, which is another aside of the more than meets the eye, sometimes the hardest part of the procedure, um, at least to me. Um, if there's mild curvature, uh, less than 30 degrees, then you can still consider doing a single stage repair with a dorsal plication and then just doing your urethroplasty. Although even in mild curvature, you can still consider doing a two-stage repair. And then in the more moderate and severe curvature, greater than 30 degrees, um, most people will now plan for a two-stage repair. And there's definitely been a shift over the last probably even five years, um, if not 10, to doing more two-stage repairs. With, um, and I'll get into a little bit of why. Uh, dividing the urethral plate, doing a corporal lengthening procedure if still needed after you divide the urethral plate. Um, and then bringing in skin to later on do a second stage. That said, there, um, for some, especially if it's on the borderline, like closer to 30 degrees, some people will still do it just a dorsal application and single stage repair. It's all that intraoperative assessment. 
couple or, or one slide on dorsal plication. You know, there's been several approaches to dorsal plication, first described by uh, Nesbitt in, in 1965, to taking out these uh, sort of wedges and closing them transversely. Um, these were done on uh, in parallel, uh, in parallel on either side, sometimes of the urethra actually for dorsal curvature, um, uh, but also in the dorsal for ventral curvature. Uh, Larry Baskin who had described the anatomy of the, the neurovascular bundle in, in the penis and found that really the neurovascular bundle is at 11 and 1. So if you do a midline dorsal plication right at 12 o'clock, then you have a nerve-free zone and you can do one right there, one or two or whatever you need. Um, and then um, Zayance uh, and Dean had described a modification of the Nesbitt which is if you're concerned about the neurovascular bundles on at sort of those two lateral sides, actually can, with a freer elevator, elevate the entire neurovascular bundle, put vest loops um, around it to lift it up, and then do your, your incisions and plications underneath so you don't risk uh, injury to the neurovascular bundle by cutting into them. Although elevating the neurovascular bundle, um, um, you know, is something you have to be very careful with. So here's just a um, quick uh, picture of the dorsal plication, the Baskin technique with a small incision through the tunica, um, and then a uh, a stitch, a buried knot stitch um, into to close the incision, sort of in a Heineken Michelitz fashion, and, and then reassessing the curvature to make sure it's resolved. Um, some people will use absorbable suture, some people will use a non-absorbable suture, and it's up to um, you know, is it something that the decision you have to make? If the curvature is too significant and you need to do corporal lengthening, um, there are a couple options for that. Um, I think most of the time, um, autologous tissue is used, which is either uh, tunica vaginalis or um, either flap or more often a graft. Or you can do a dermal uh, graft, which I'll have another picture, but it's actually taking a of ellipse of skin from the, um, the groin area uh, and just getting the dermis and then attacking it on there. Um, or some people will use um, SIS as a, as a patch here. Other approaches are to do mul multiple really thin sort of um, corporal incisions that don't go all the way through into uh, through the tunica albuginea, a single ventral corporotomy. And now some people are uh, talking about doing sort of three corporotomies and then covering it with the urethra, but not truly grafting it. Here's a, just a picture of a corporoplasty with a, a dermal patch graft. Um, so you incise the tunica albuginea um, opposite to the point of the ma maximal curvature and making sure to go as wide as possible to fully hinge, hinge the opening so it's, a, it's completely straight. Um, but when you go wide, you have to make sure not to go all the way back to the dorsal side and um, injure the neurovascular bundle. Um, measure out the size that you need. This is a, the groin of the child. Measure um, uh, the same shape that you need, and size it, defat it, um, and take off the the dermis, the epidermis, and defat the dermis, and then uh, secure it in place with a running uh, an osmosis sort of in four quadrants, and then just close the groin incision. You can see here. So the pros and cons of, of each one for plication, dorsal plication is quicker. Single, you can do it in a single stage repair because you're not grafting the whole corpora. Uh, probably minimal risk for erectile dysfunction. Um, cons are then people concerned about recurrence, especially if um, it's used for more significant curvature and people question the long-term effectiveness. Um, penile lengthening procedures uh, are, I would say, for sure more effective for severe curvature um, and does potentially um, elongate the penis, but there is probably more risk for erectile dysfunction, especially when done in an older population. Um, it takes longer and you commits patients to a two-stage procedure. So not everyone is distal though, um, or some distals will fool you and actually are mid-shaft or more proximal. So other approaches that you can use. Um, one that we've tended to use quite a bit, although I know more and more people are going away from this in favor of a two-stage approach, is an island onlay flap. Um, and this is where you take the sort of the, the inner propitial skin of that dorsal hooded foreskin you take that off on the dartos pedicle, just like when you're taking the dartos pedicle for a separate layer of coverage, and you can swing it around. And if your urethral plate is narrow, 
you attach it on one side of the urethral plate and then fold it over so you're like an augmented roof uh, urethroplasty, fold it over and, and then trim it and then anastomose it on the other side. Then you have all this nice dark toast to cover over it as a second as a second layer, and then you close your 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 glands. One of the downsides, um, so we'll go into complications, but this this approach is more at risk for uh, diverticulate because you don't have good spongiosum backing on this overlying skin, but it also might increase the risk of a glands dehiscence because there's so much bulk um, of this top area. So if you're trying to only bring the, the glands, you know, the meatus to maybe the, the proximal glands, you're okay. But when you go to the top, if there's too much bulk, you can get glands dehiscence. Then for proximal hypospadias, um, it can be one versus a two, two stage repair. As I mentioned, there's been a, a more of a trend towards two stage repairs. Um, the first stage is correcting that curvature with one of the techniques that we've discussed. And then um, after you've corrected the curvature, you rearrange the, the dorsal skin onto the ventrum um, to prepare for the second stage. In the second stage, you come back and you actually do your full urethroplasty, do the glansplasty, depending on how far out you want to bring the urethra, and then uh, cover the penile shaft. So just some um, schematics of the first stage repair. Um, marking your, your incisions, you want to leave um, space when you're marking your incisions for that furlet collar. Um, degloving the penis and that well, the importance of degloving is one to maximize straightening um, and to getting rid of all that just sort of or releasing the dysplastic skin um, to getting down to just the corpora and then doing an artificial erection um, fixing um, let's say you do have to fix curvature you could you might divide the urethral plate and peel the urethra off um, and that might straighten it, or you might do that and then still have to do a corporotomy like we've gone through. Then um, one of the most common ways for ventral skin coverage is buyer's flaps. So you incise down the midline and bring the skin um, to the front and sort of the, oh, oops, um, in, in the midline to um, let this heal in. Now, some people will make incision into the glands and lay in that buyer's flap into the glands, and that prepares you for um, in the next stage versus if you don't think you're going to go all the way up to the glands, you don't have to make that incision into the, um, uh, into the glands. The other thing is some people will do sort of a, just like you take your island on leg, um, flap, uh, over here, you can take all, all of your excess penile shin, skin and then flap it over and do, have, um, prepare your ventral skin with a huge, um, island on leg flap of skin. Um, in the second stage, you come back, this is all healed up. You make your U-stage shape marking. That's going to be the planned nail urethra. You tubularize that in your two layer, um, you know, double running layer over uh, appropriate size tube. Then you get your uh, barrier layer, um, which is often going to be dartos from the sides, or you can bring up tunica vaginalis from the scrotum. And then you cover, um, and then you close the skin. This is an example of the tunica vaginalis. The testis is up down here, um, peeling off the tunica vaginalis. And then you have to make sure you get it proximal enough so that it doesn't tether and cause twist on your penis. Um, and then covering over the second layer. Um, so there's no surgeries without complications. Um, and especially hypospadias uh, is probably the surgery that we do. It's some of the highest complication rate. Types of complications include fistula, urethrocutaneous fistula come in various shapes and sizes, most commonly at the previous meatus or the coronal margin, which is just where there's just not as much blood supply. Um, can be due to ischemia, edema, which could lead to ischemia, meatal stenosis, so if you have a um, tight outlet resistance, then the backup pressure can uh, pop a fistula um, proximal to it. Um, Usually you want to delay your repair at least six to 12 months to allow for full healing. Um, when you go to assess the, the, the problem, always calibrate the meatus to make sure that meatal stenosis hadn't been the cause of it. And then if it's proximal, you can do a primary closure with flaps. Um, however, if it's a distal uh, fistula at the level of the coronal margin, these are much more hard to fix. And usually we have to open everything back down again 
and either do a one or two stage repair after opening everything. The other uh, complications that, as you mentioned in the island onlay, you can get as urethral diverticulum, um, often also caused by distal outlet, re distal outlet resistance. So you have to make sure there's no medial stenosis. If it's, if it's very small and not causing infections, not causing problems, sometimes you can leave it alone. If it's big and ballooning like this, then um, you can often excise the redundancy and just close it down. But again, making sure that you've calibrated the distal urethra so that it doesn't just happen again. Uh, glans dehiscence, uh, as also mentioned with the island on life flap, um, can be due to too much tension on your glans closure, vascular compromise. Uh, can be challenging. Now, sometimes you might say, hey, I'm just going to leave it here. If they're peeing, if their penis is straight, peeing straight, leave it for another time. Versus if you do want to go back, especially if the glands is more flattened, which might have led to the dehiscence, um, it may require a two-stage approach or with uh, at least using an inlay to, to get enough um, width and girth and flexibility of the glands to cover it over. Um, Urethral stricture, which I'll get into, again, ways to treat, but it can form at the junction often of the native and new urethra, especially in long proximal repairs. Also can be due to ischemia, trauma, infection, um, and may require multi-stage repair. And recurrent curvature is one that I think now is getting more and more focus um, because it occurs and often worsens at puberty when, when uh, the penis enlarges, and that's when you're noticing that the plication or the one stage proximal repair is coming back very curved. Um, and that can lead to a very, uh, like a long process of a multiple stage repair. So for a um, repair of a stricture, if you, some people will do a dorsal inlay one stage buckle repair. I think it's probably less common, especially in our practice. Um, but if there's no BXO, there's no significant uh, sort of damage to the tissues around, uh, but if the urethral plate is, is just scarred, but it's otherwise intact, you can size the urethral plate, lay a piece of buckle into that, and then tubular is all in, in one go. More often, we'll do two-stage buckle repair. So open down the strictured urethra, excise the, all that strictured urethra that's not going to be um, good either due to BXO or if it has hair from a previous repair um, or if it's acting as a scar and causing sort of um, uh, recurrent cordy, excise all that, straighten the penis, and then add in um, a buckle graft and, and leave it to, to, to peel and take, um, and then come back at another time. And just like a second stage primary urethroplasty, make your U-shaped incision around, tubularize it, and then have some extra dartos from around to, as a second layer, and then close the skin. As far as the buckle, it can be um, either uh, cheek versus lip. Um, some thought of that cheek in increases your risk of glands dehiscence because it's much more bulky. Often in kids, we tend to use lip, and in adults, we use more cheek. Um, there's about a 4% um, donor site complication from scarring um, and um, sort of contracture. Um, once you do put the graft on, we tend to quilt the graft to prevent any hematoma underneath, which can prevent the neovascularization and, and take of the graft. So the trickiest part of hypospadias is the outcomes. Um, well, I think finding the right surgery and doing the right surgery, but also following outcomes. Um, partly because it, it just there's such variability. Um, for distal hypospadias repair, pretty can you know, across the board, about between 5 and 20% complication rate. Proximal hypospadias, anywhere reported 23 to 68% complication rate. Definitely, there's been shown recently that there's a higher rate of complications the longer you follow them up. Only 50% of the complications, and that number can vary, occur within the first year. So um, more and more, we're seeing the importance of following these kids after toilet training and into puberty to see what the true complication rate is. This is, these are very sobering numbers, even for distal hypospadias. Whenever I'm counseling a family, I say there's no other surgery we do, maybe extrophy, that has as high a complication rate. Um, and it's hard to, you know, to take that. But I think if their families are counseled, they'll understand. So why do we not have great, you know, consensus on outcomes? Well, there's up until now, and there's been more focus now, on a standardized assessment. 
what are the preoperative characteristics? If you're starting with a very straight distal glandular hypospadias and call it a distal versus a distal hypospadias that's proximal glands, but you know has uh, core D and ventral skin deficiency, those two aren't, they might both be quoted as distal, but they're not the same severity. So preoperative characteristics hasn't been standardized up until now, intra or previous to now. Intraoperative details and has not always been standardized. How big was the neo-urethra? How long was it? All these things. And then postoperative uh, evaluation also hasn't been standardized. Um, are flow rates being done um, to assess for stricture, or is it just when they finally present with you know in the inability to avoid? Patient reported outcomes haven't been standardized. So there's a whole bunch of factors that make the outcomes that we've had up until now really challenging. Um, but addressing the long-term follow-up and the fact that uh, we're now seeing more complications for longer-term follow-up, recently there's been several studies showing that that the time um, to uh, fistula presentation uh, can be delayed. 31% in the study presented after one year of age. And so if a study has only four or five-month follow-up, we might be missing a lot of those uh, uh, complications that are presenting. Um, another uh, study looked at over a thousand boys with hypospadias. Um, and in that study, 53% of the complications presented after the first year. Um, and you can see here, sure, the proximal ones really has a long tapering. And this is time to not, undergo, not undergoing repeat um, intervention. Uh, distal and mid shaft over here. So the total trend still is over after the first year, you can see a lot of complications. Um, and uh, you know, Chris Long, um, one of my partners here, also presented on sort of the late presentation of complications. Again, over a thousand boys, complications ranging around the ten per ten percent range for distal, close to twenty percent for mid shaft, and over fifty percent for proximal hypospadias. And again, forty seven percent of complications were detected within the first year, but that means the others were after one year. And the mean time to complication was. 69 uh, months, um, you know, for distal repairs and 29 months for proximal. So both well over uh, a year and sometimes longer term. So we're seeing farther out, even this distal uh, repair can have problems. Oops. Um, and this is just the, the graph from his study of um, the, the time to complications again for, for distal mid shaft and, and uh, sorry, proximal mid shaft and more distal repairs. Um, overall, you know, a lot of, in that first slide that I said, there was over 6,000 publications um, on hypospadias. The majority have always been on distal hypospadias and how to repair distal hypospadias. More and more tension on proximal hypospadias shows us that it's really a, a dismal uh, rate of complications. And again, preparing families for this, I think is one of the most important things we can do. And this is four studies back to back showing um, all for proximal hypospadias all around ish the same time, median follow up between 30 and, 30 and 40 months. So pretty long follow up, but not perfect. Two stage repair, 68% complication rate requiring unplanned surgery. Two stage repairs, 53%. Some single, single stage repairs, also 60, um, uh, you know, 61 for the long tip. Um, 52 for the dorsal inlay or restage repair. And in, in our series, um, complication, 56% complication rates overall, 49% um, for two-stage and 62% for one-stage repair. So still seeing more complications in the one-stage repairs. So all of this goes to show that overall in the course of management of hypospadias, it's been a little bit of a change of mindset that it's not necessarily just a condition of infancy that we fix and you move along, but it's really a lifelong issue um, requiring lifelong assessment by the surgeon, but also attention by the family so that they know that things, um, you know, that it's necessary for them to come back and just be, be checked periodically. Some of those long-term considerations that have come up are really what happens to the repairs in the boys as they grow, not just the things that are gonna present like fistulas, um, and strictures, but recurrent curvature. How how do we know who's going to have troubles later on? 
Will reconstructive tissue have the same growth potential, especially after puberty? And this is the importance of following kids after puberty. And then the sort of the patient reported side of how happy are patients? Are the surgeons as good as assessing the outcomes of patients as far as quality of life? So, you know, you know, cosmetic satisfaction, sexual function satisfaction. And when can you really assess some of those things um, for sexual function? Obviously, you have to wait until well after puberty. And for urinary function, do we know that if we see them even at seven years old, is that really enough? Um, as far as patient-reported outcomes, there are a handful of questionnaires that have been developed, all probably within the last 10 years, some a little bit earlier, um, you know, 10, maybe 15 years now, um, to really try to measure quality of life and satisfaction in, in patients. And we have to, to focus on this, but most of them focus on cosmetic outcomes, which is very important but we don't have as much um, patient reported outcomes on urinary function, sexual function, and psychosocial um, sort of uh, function or the psychosocial element to it. Um, and that has to be a part of our consideration going forward. So we have to remember we're operating on these kids as little kids, but in adolescence, they are really at risk for poor body image, concern with their diagnosis. The parents definitely have that concern early in life, but we have to remember that they will have that concern or may have that concern later on. Um, and um, so we just have to be attuned to it, make sure we're constantly sort of asking the question. Um, as far as some psychosexual uh, studies, they've shown similar age at outset of sexual contact, but maybe less satisfied. Again, all of these areas that need further study to really understand what these boys grow through later on. So all that said, I think the importance is, you know, surgery is just one part of it. And sort of what what surgery to do is a huge part of it, uh, when to do it, but then the follow-up and the importance of long-term follow-up and how we're following them. We see kids back, of course, after stent removal, et cetera, six to 12 months seeing them back, how are they doing? At toilet training or after toilet training, so you can do a Euroflow. It's really, really important, uh, and we're making sure to get Euroflows or at least a video of warning, making sure that the stream is a decent caliber, strength, not spraying around 10 or 11 years old or prior to puberty, make sure that before they go through puberty, still they're avoiding well. And then after puberty, you could do it right after 14, 15 or around 18 um, to make sure again, that they're doing a Euroflow, getting uh, assessing sort of how they're doing overall. And then maybe for high risk patients, even making sure that we're following them well into adulthood. And this is the that focus of their transition care. Um, we're having the kids meet um, Caleb Cavell um, in that teenage time, and then he's carrying them on, sometimes still at CHOP, and then sometimes carrying them on to the adult side, um, into the adult clinic, uh, to still follow them because if they're really high risk. Um, so just to, to end with, um, you know, hypospadiology in this picture of, of John Duckett, who, who was such a founder in how we do hypospadias today, um, remembering that hypospadiology is not just a study of boys with hypospadias and their outcomes, but also a very difficult scientist, science that is humbling and energy consuming um, and all consuming sometimes. So thank you very much. Um, I realized that I could not really see the chat box in this, so I will stop sharing my screen so maybe I can see. Um... Oh wait, I didn't, now I can see it. I didn't have it up, um, but if there's any questions, I would be happy to take any questions that you have. <clears throat> that was uh, an excellent talk. Thank you. I um, <clears throat> I have a couple questions. I guess I'll start with uh, we'll go one at a time in case anybody else wants to chime in, but. Um, in in the studies that you mentioned that looked at uh, complication rates uh, of overall and then distal versus proximal, did any of the studies or any studies that you know of look at uh, practitioners who give testosterone to everyone regardless of size versus those who just uh, give it based on size? Because, you know, think about regardless of size, you're increasing the vascularity at your repair site, maybe that will help prevent future complications. Has that really been, I know that testosterone, you know, uh, it's been published that that decreases uh, complications, but that's been theorized that that's just because it increases size. 
but has anybody looked at it, um, you know, independent of size? <clears throat> you know, I, I don't think that, I think people have looked at the risk of complications from sort of a wound healing standpoint, but not in that overall independent of size uh, standpoint of all comers, you know, the ones who give it to everyone versus the one who give it to just some. And to be honest, some of the data doesn't even have whether or not they got testosterone. And because those studies were more focused on the effects of testosterone. And that's a great question. And that's one of those things that um, as far as sort of recording, uh, knowing what we're doing at the time of surgery, what preoperative assessment they had, what preoperative treatment they had, and then looking at outcomes. That's something that we're hoping to be able to answer. Um, I don't, as far as I know, we don't have that yet, but it's a great point. And one of those, you know, we've set up um, a very standardized uh, preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative template for recording our hypospadias. Um, both in a clinic with measurements, et cetera, whether or not they got testosterone, what type of repair they had, and post-op measurements again. And that's all being recorded. And um, Chris Long has been working with Melise Keys, who's up in Canada, um, and in developing a uh, like a smart form um, within Epic that can be shared across the country for people to use the same standardization in the hope that we can start to gather all of that information of Who's who's getting what when um, to to really discover what the outcomes are going to be? Thanks. Um, my next question is uh, on the kind of psychosexual uh, aspect uh, of um, patients with hypospadias. Uh, or those who un have undergone repair and then, you know, go through puberty and they're at that. Do you have um, sort of multidisciplinary clinic? Do you think multidisciplinary clinics should exist when they do go through puberty uh, and you do see them at that, at that follow-up appointment that you kind of have that discussion with them and then kind of send them automatically to uh, a therapist or you screen out particular ones? You know, you never know. Some kid might say there's nothing wrong with him and then they um, really actually think that there is something wrong with their um, uh, penis. So, like, do, do you have that at CHOP, or do you think it should should exist as, as a regular standardized thing? Oh, an another great question. You know, we well, we don't have a set multidisciplinary clinic in that, like, everyone's in the room at the same time. We do have a clinical psychologist. We used to have two. Now we have one. We're going to be hiring another one um, because she's packed all the time. Um, we have a clinical psychologist that works within urology um, and just sees only urology patients. She happens to be she. She doesn't see just these patients. She sees all comers, neurogen bladder, extra feet, all those, um, and even some just dysfunctional voiders. But we definitely utilize her, and especially for these kids. Now, it is, you know, practitioner dependent on who we refer. I personally like to refer kids very quickly to to her because I think that they the clinical psychologists do have a very different uh, armamentarium of tools to be able to talk to these kids, get them to open up. Um, I think, you know, if it's just a, a distal hypospadias that looks good, is functioning good, I probably wouldn't send them. Um, but for the kids who have um, more severe disease, for sure. Um, and I think the most of us send it send them. But I think it's a great point that that probably should be more standardized because if it is just dependent on, let's say, the clinician who's seeing them, you know, and follow up, I think some of that sometimes does get lost. Like, oh, your, 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 your flow is great. You know, come back next year. Whereas maybe that should be one of those. We have all these other check boxes of, are we following up appropriately? Did you do the your flow? I think getting that in as a standardized at least question to think about would be really, really important. Um, and I do think it's valuable, you know, in all places because uh, as kids go through adolescence, especially is the, is the trickiest time. And you're right that not every kid is going to bring up their concerns. I've been impressed by how many kids do bring up their concerns. Um, and I'm very happy when they do, because then we can get them to the right place. Um, but it probably should be a screening question um, and maybe some more of the sort of patient reported outcome questionnaires will help to, to guide that. But I think it should be a standard question at least. Thank you. A uh, couple questions coming in. Um, so actually Dr. Kogan has been signed in, but he's one of the call-in users having computer issues. 
So he's he's texting me questions now. Um, uh, the uh, first question is, um, what is your general uh, practice when it comes to testosterone? Is 14 your your personal, I mean, is 14 your cutoff um, or do you have other kind of things that you go by? What are your indications for testosterone? Um, so I try to use 14 as a cutoff. Uh, and I'm just going to be totally honest with you guys. You, sometimes the measurements in the, the clinic are not ideal. Um, and we have some discussions, conversations amongst our group because some people don't feel like trying to even measure in the clinic is valuable because the, the, the measurements are so hard. The kids kicking, screaming is all over the place. Um, but I personally tried to use 14 then I got to the point that sometimes I'd say 14 didn't give testosterone and they still seem pretty small. Um, so I've now, I do measure, but I also use a little bit of gestalt in there. If it just looks a little small, then I'll give them, if it looks decent, but a little small, I'll give them one dose. And I've found, I've been happy actually with the, even just the one dose. If the penis it measures quite small, like 13 or 12, I'll give them two doses. Um, I also will weigh in the, the, the degree of the, the urethral groove. If it's a very flattened um, glands, then I'll definitely do the two, two um, uh, doses to try to get them a little bit bigger um, because I think it'll help to roll the glands a little bit more. But if they're sort of 14-ish, 15-ish, but have a deep groove, then I won't give it to them. So I don't know if that answers your questions. I think I'm, I'm much more not dogmatic, whereas I can tell you that some of my partners will give it to everyone and other ones will try to measure um, and try to, to gauge on the exact measurements. But knowing that my measurements have not always been perfect, um, I'm, I'm doing a little gestalt in there. Yeah, I mean, we've I found the same experience in, in our clinics when we try to <clears throat> measure them. First of all, we we don't use the, the metal calipers because the kids are flailing around. You know, you're worried to stab in the penis. So we use the regular surgical ruler. And then again, like you said, when they're moving around, it's almost impossible. What um, we did do for the calipers is we, um, honestly, I think that Dr. Canning took them home or maybe he got in trouble for doing this, but he took them home and ground them down. So all of them have been ground down. So they're not as sharp anymore. Cause like when you first get them, there's, I would poke myself in the fingers and it would hurt like trying to pretend I would have it on my fingers to not be hurting the kid, but with them ground down, it's actually a lot easier and a lot safer. Maybe I'll just have to steal ours from clinic. Um, and then uh, one other question uh, from Dr. Kogan is, uh, do you, uh, can you avoid incised plate in most distal repairs? Because I know in your lecture, you did mention that you're mostly doing tears to play. So yeah. most of your repairs, you're able to avoid incising the plate? Yeah, we really have been. Um, whether it's a combination of the use of testosterone or just sort of erring on the side of measuring your plate wider, as long as it can get 11 or 12 millimeters, which most of them, again, just maybe because the testosterone I've been able to do. I only have had to incise a couple. And just recently, um, so it was Friday, Thursday, Thursday I was in the OR um, and did it, had to incise it, but it was a very, very flat uh, uh, glands. And I knew from when I saw them in clinic, I was going to have to do that. So I actually ended up incising the plate and putting a dorsal inlet graft and then tubularizing. Um, which a, a lot of my colleagues will also do because everyone has sort of gotten away from doing straight tips. But if you incise pretty far out, I haven't had a problem, especially if they have some element of a, of a groove. 